بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد رسول الله I begin with the name of Allah All praise belongs to Allah May peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad For he is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam الحمد لله So now we've been talking about purity Wudu, Qusul and the like And this is from the book Al-Maqasid The Objectives by Imam Nawawi May Allah Ta'ala shower him with mercy Now there's one section from another book That I want to mention here this is from a book called Umdat al-Salik, more commonly known as The Reliance of the Traveler. This was translated into English a few years ago, and it's gained some popularity. This is an intermediate text of Shafi Fiqh. It says, if someone is sure of purity, but unsure whether it was nullified, then he remains pure, because in the sacred law, certainty is not dispelled by doubt. Now this last phrase here, which means certainty is not dispelled by doubt, this is a fundamental principle in the sacred law. This is called a qa'ida, a fundamental principle. You can say a maxim, an axiom. From this principle, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of rulings that are derived from it. So what does this mean, that certainty is not dispelled by doubt? Let's say, for example, you know someone for 20 years of your life. He's a good friend of yours. You know him to be trustworthy. Whenever he speaks, he tells the truth. Whenever he says he's going to do something, he does it on time. He's trustworthy from all you've known of him. And then randomly someday someone comes up to you with a piece of gossip. They say, you know that person there? He's a thief. He steals money from his company and no one knows about it. Now, from what you know, you are certain that this person is trustworthy. You've known him for 20 years. You have seen no signs of deception from him. So what do you do with this piece of gossip that says otherwise? You throw it to the side. You cast it aside. Because you have certainty that he is trustworthy. And one piece of doubt does not take that away. That's what this means. Certainty is not dispelled by doubt. And this plays out in every aspect of life. The only thing that takes away this certainty is another form of certainty. Let's say if there's indisputable proof that this person is a thief. And it's clear. There's evidence. There's testimonies. It's clear that he is a thief. Then that certainty that you had is now dispelled by another form of certainty. But aside from that, if you have certainty, little bits of doubt shouldn't take that away from you. Now, in this particular context, we're talking about wudu and ghusl. In this context, this means if you perform wudu, let's say you perform in the early morning, and then a few hours pass by and it's time to pray, and you think to yourself, I know I perform wudu, but I'm not sure if I broke it. I don't know if I went to the bathroom, I don't remember touching anybody of the opposite gender, so... According to this principle, you still have wudu. Your wudu is still intact because you are certain that you performed it. You have a vivid memory of performing it. But did you break your wudu? That's what you're unsure about. So what you're sure about trumps what you're not sure about. Certainty is not dispelled by doubt. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, If one of you feels something in his belly, but he is unsure if anything has exited or not, he should not leave the mosque, i.e. in order to go wash up, until he hears a sound or smells an odor. And this happens sometimes. Let's say if you eat something, now you have an upset stomach. When you go to pray and you do your sujood, sometimes you might feel a rumbling in your stomach. And you might think to yourself, uh-oh, did I break my wudu? The answer is, you did not break your wudu. Unless you know that you passed the wind for sure by either hearing it or smelling it, you should assume that your wudu is still intact. And this applies to other situations as well. For example, let's say you go to the bathroom and you relieve yourself. And then you perform istinja. You wash your private parts with water. A few minutes later, let's say you feel some type of moisture in your underwear, in your pants. And you might think to yourself, uh-oh, is that urine? The answer is, you should assume that it's not urine. Why? Because you performed istinja. And if you know you don't suffer from any type of urinary incontinence, where the urine just exits on its own unintentionally, if you don't suffer from this, you know you performed this in jab properly, then assume that moisture you feel is water. It's not urine. And I'm mentioning this because some people, they get a little bit, uh, you can say, obsessive compulsive about things like this, about performing wudu, about performing qusul, about using the bathroom. And they think any slight doubt somehow nullifies their wudu. The religion tells us certainty is not dispelled by doubt. You assume things are pure by default. 
And when you purify yourself, you assume that you're purified. Any little doubt, any little scruple, any weswasa whispering that you might have filth on your body or that you might have mistakenly done something wrong in the wudu, anything like this, dispel it. That's not part of the religion. Alhamdulillah. So hopefully this is useful. Now there's something else I want to mention. We've gone through a lot of details. If you go through this video series, there's a lot of details of how to perform wudu, how to perform ghusl, all the different types of rulings in terms of is something wajib, is it a mandub, is it makruh, and so on and so forth. And when people first learn this, they may feel a little bit overwhelmed because it's a lot of things to remember, a lot of numbers, a lot of integrals, a lot of bullet points, and so on. But that's not how the religion should be practiced. All of this is for the sake of education. But what happens is when you learn how to perform wudu, for example, at first it seems like a laundry list of things. But after you perform wudu for a few days, for a few weeks, for a few months, a few years, you just do it naturally. In fact, if you go to the average Muslim and you say, when you perform wudu, what are the integrals and what are the recommendations? Most people probably won't be able to answer that question because they've been performing wudu for years and it sort of all blends into one. What's the sunnah? What's the fard? It's sort of mixed in. They just know I perform wudu like this and I've been doing this since I was five years old, for example. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. I'll give you a real life example of this. When you first learn how to drive a car, what happens is you sit in the driver's seat and whoever's your instructor, he's telling you things. He's telling you, put your hands on the wheel, 10 and 2, 10 a.m. on the clock, 2 p.m. on the clock. That's how you should put your hands on the wheel. And check your rear view mirror and check your side view mirror and put your seatbelt on and then turn on the ignition and then put the car in the proper gear and then check your blind spot and make sure that you have enough gas and make sure that you're going at the right speed limit, not too fast, not too slow. And all these rules, all these rules. When you first drive, you're thinking about all these rules. It's very mechanical. After a few days, a few weeks, a few months, few years, you just drive. You don't even think about these rules anymore. You do them naturally. And if someone were to ask you, when you drive, what do you do? How do you start your car? You would say, I don't know. <laughs> I just start my car. But the reality is, you do a lot of things. You do all the things that you learned from the get-go. But you don't think about it. It becomes second nature. The same thing with learning the religion. If you study aqidah, if you study fiqh, Arabic grammar and so on, if you study any subject, at first it seems like a lot of rules, a lot of things to memorize. But after a while, it becomes second nature to you. This religion has to mix with your flesh and blood. You feel it. It's not something that you just memorize, a bunch of lists of things. You have to feel it. And honestly, if you've been Muslim long enough, you know what I'm talking about. When you're in a state of janabah, of major ritual impurity, it's almost like you can feel that you're in this state. It's not something you can even describe in words. You just know, I'm in a state. I shouldn't be touching the Quran now. And then when you lift that state by performing ghusl, you actually feel it. You feel it in your soul, like I'm, I'm in a different state now. Some people, they get to a level where they can sense their wudu just like that. I know when I don't have wudu. It's not a matter of, I remember using the bathroom, I touch someone of the opposite gender. They can just feel, I'm not in the state of wudu. And then they go perform wudu. Because these rulings, they become a part of you. They become part of your flesh and bone. So alhamdulillah, I think that's worth mentioning because at first when people learn these things, they become obsessive and they think about do's and don'ts. After a while, it just becomes a part of who you are. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ala ashabihi wa ala atba'ihi wa ala man wa ala hu hatta yamul qiyamati wa salam tasliman kathira.